Hello and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today we're going to give you a sales page 101 lesson. Yes, 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 yes. I love when you brought this up last week when we were talking about buckets of time. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, you know, the perfect opportunity for us to really dive into sales pages. We've never talked about this. Right. I, we haven't, I don't think we've barely talked about copywriting really at all or sales copywriting at any at least but writing a sales page mm -hmm. is a complete evergreen skill it's so so <laughs> good to have that ability and i know a lot of people they'll burn days just staring at a page and just like vomiting up all of the things about how great their thing is and and all the features and so forth and they're just like ah, and they know something's wrong and they're mushing things around on a layout in wordpress and it's just ah, and they show it to people and, and people are like ah, what is this and you're just like oh <laughs> so over the years i have sort of cobbled together a a basic format for a kind of like 80 20 rule you know just the basics of a sales page from a bunch of different people from uh geez brennan dunn amy hoy sean de souza i think eric davis gave me some input on it and just tips i've picked up from everyone from pat flynn to dan kennedy and and i have a page on my website called building the perfect sales page that shows you like the nine sections of the the bulk of the page is made up of these nine sections and the first four of them are the most important. So like the, the first four are like absolutely critical to get right or, or very beneficial to get right. And then the ones well, after that. Because they stop reading. <laughs> if they yeah, don't exactly. get it right, they stop there. Exactly. But they're also the core piece. And it, it's the value proposition is, is wrapped up in those first four sections, really the first three sections. And then the fourth one is the first call to action. And then the, rem the remainder of the page is a little bit more in the persuasion category. It's things like social proof and uh, reversing objections or addressing objections, and then another call to action, and then uniqueness, what's different about you, and then the the urgency at the very end. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I do it. I find it's very easy for people to understand when they're first getting to getting into the, trying to develop this skill. Now, but there are plenty of other ways to do it, and. It, in fact, I think that's what makes it a little bit hard to write a good sales page because when you find someone who's super advanced, like say Ramit, it just his page is like two miles long. You you don't know yeah. what what to emulate. You can't see the structure; it's kind of invisible. So I try to keep them. I I tried to come up with something that was a very simple framework that people could kind of more or less drop, sort of brain dump into each section and then cobble that into you know, something that will make sense so that when someone comes to the page, they'll immediately know if this is something for them. They'll immediately know whether or not it's worth their time to keep reading the page. They can scan the page and get the gist and, and be like, oh yeah, I should really drill into this. And then they start, you know, then and only then probably do they start reading the body copy. So this is, this is tried and true proven method, not invented by me, but perhaps a, a bit of a patchwork that I've pulled together. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this will be a little bit tricky to do in an audio only format. So we're considering um, doing a <laughs> video version of this where I go through one of Rochelle's pages. Rochelle's volunteered to be a guinea pig. Yes. See, <laughs> I don't just ask you guys to be the guinea pig. I'm willing to do it myself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I, I do these all the time in Ditcherville. People are always writing a new sales page and they want someone to review it. And it's really it'd be impossible to do without video, to do an actual teardown without video because you need to be able to see what I'm seeing and see where I'm scrolled in the page and where my mouse is and all of that. But I think we can walk through the, the big beats of this and at least give people an idea of whether or not they think this is for them. And if you want to click through to the links in the show notes to get the template, maybe watch the video if we do that and um, see some examples that are, are not super advanced like examples that stick to the format so that you can see the template and then you can also see a completed one and say like oh oh okay i get it so that's yeah. the plan yeah i think it's easier when you can look at some that follow the template right right okay well if if you are at your computer and you want to follow along from home i'm going to be going through a page on my website that is called how to build a perfect sales page i mentioned that already it's, it should be in the show notes and 
uh, if you can't find it, it's, uh, I think, right on my homepage at jonathanstark.com. There's a link to it in the popular links section near the top. It's super easy to find. It's building-the-perfect-sales-page. <laughs> <laughs> dash, dash, dash. <laughs> dash, dash. I say that for the people who don't automatically think words have to be separated by a dash. <laughs> All right. So let's go here and start with pain. Start with pain. Again, this is this is just one way to do it, but it's really it's it's eighty twenty rule. Just follow this, don't mess with it, and you'll be fine. Once you get more advanced, you can flip sections around or take a different approach but yes yeah, section one is pain so when I you want someone to know immediately that you understand them and by describing their their pain probably better than they can or at least in a way that shocks them that you're aware of it they're automatically going to be somewhat convinced or beginning to trust that you've got a solution to this thing because you've you've articulated the pain that to them is something they haven't even shared with anyone. They don't have anybody to talk to about it. And they're just mm -hmm. like, oh yes, this is exactly, this is exactly what's going on. So it's their, it's, it's their current state. Basically it's this thing that's, that is an opportunity for improvement or something they've been wrestling with. It's it, the expensive problem. And in this section, you just sort of list out, uh, sometimes I just say sound familiar bullet point, pain, 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 pain. And well, it's kind of like the heck yeah headlines. It's just very pain focused. Mm -hmm. Right. If you think about it that way, that's a, that's an easy way to bullet it if you're not feeling like you're you're a grand author or copywriter. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, I mean, pain is pain is just the. It's actually not the word I used for this section originally. That's the word that people use for it. The pain dream fix sales page format is a pretty common thing. And it's just the problem. They're stuck. They're cold. They're wet. They are lost. They are um, angry, frustrated. A, a lot of times you want to use, I mean, I, I generally use emotionally charged language in this section. It can mm -hmm. be a little spammy and manipulative if you go over the top. It can feel that way. But I do like to use emotions because that those are the things we're going to change. We're going to change how they feel. This product or service is going to change those feelings from the bad version to the good version. And so, that's what we buy. We buy yeah. how something is going to make us feel. We don't buy on logic. Right. Yeah. The logic is sort of is sort of post facto rationalization. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you this this gets people's attention. So you know, are you sick of running out of printer ink at the worst possible time? You know, are you sick of? Are you frustrated? Does it drive you nuts? That yada yada yada. Mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Uh, tailored to your audience because you can't you know if your audience is data scientists they might not respond very well to you know comically overcharged language or uh, that's when it feels perhaps. spammy right yeah that's when it feels spammy to your audience and the, the definition is very specific audience specific mm -hmm. yeah so if you so the the example that i use on the page is you know you're cold and wet you don't like it you're soaked to the bone you're shivering you know, just as a, as a sort of a comic book version of this. So this is the, the person's current situation. They're sick and tired. They're frustrated. They are at the end of their rope. Uh, they're working weekends and afraid if they miss one more soccer game, their spouse is going to leave them. The kids are going to not love them anymore. You know, it's like this, <laughs> they're in this bad situation that they want to change. So the next section is the reverse. It's the dream section. And a lot of people will skip over this section and we'll, you'll see why in a second. They'll go straight from pain to fix. They'll start talking about their solution, how great it is. Uh, but you don't want to skip the dream section, even if you think it's irrelevant because it's not. So in the dream section, you want to present the reader with the mirror image of the pain. You want to flip it. So instead of being in the pain, the current problem situation, you paint a picture of the problem being gone and what it will be like, how they will feel when the problem is gone. And, you know, so for the, for the cold and wet example, it's like, imagine being warm and dry and just cozy and toasty and, and make that, make them visualize the flip from where they are to where they want to be. You know, it's, the you fire see this fire in the cottage, yeah. the rains outside, you're toasty and warm and cozy. right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's visualized. Visualize really helps. I think here. Yes, I think so too. Especially cause we sell in, the thing that we all sell is invisible. It is the feeling. 
So mm -hmm. it's hard to come up with sort of imagery, visual imagery to describe it. So you have nothing really to talk about except for the problems. Um, again, if you go super spammy, you can, you know, the pile, you know, Scrooge McDuck jumping in the pile of money, surfing down coins and things like that, or people sitting on a beach. That's where all of that stuff comes from. Okay. So, right, they're, they're drawing the, the dream. So in this particular case, I, I keep the, I, I try to keep the dream distinct from the solution. You can kind of sprinkle it in there, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean. So the idea of the dream section is to, is, is it's the after picture. So if you think of like a, a Weight Watchers, you know, before and after photo, you want the after you want to, you don't just want the before picture. That's not going to get people to pull into the parking lot. You want the before and the after so they can see the difference. And it's like, this plays into testimonials too, but we might talk about that later. But in the dream section, you want to paint the picture of the desired future state of the ideal reader of this page. And again, this will sort of cement in them that y you understand what they want. So you understand where they are, that's the pain, and then you understand what they want, and that's the dream. And so for different people, that's obviously going to be different things. But it's a great example when you're starting for the first time to write a new sales page with this format to use bullet points in the pain section and full sentences. You are sick of, or mm -hmm. are you sick of this? Are you frustrated by that? Does it drive you crazy that this other thing is true? So let's just stick with three like that. And then in the dream section, even just as an exercise for yourself, you want to literally flip each one of those previous bullets. So if the first one, and it's hard to do this in the abstract, but if the first one was, you, uh, are you cold and wet and shivering? Flipping it would, would literally, it's hard to do this in my head, but you, are you warm and dry and cozy? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I wouldn't talk about fire and roaring anything yet. It would just be, <laughs> right? Because what happens is, a lot of times what happens is, there'll be a few pain bullets that you can't flip because there's no op opposite, which means that you snuck a solution or you you snuck an assumption into your pains that yeah the assumption is they want to be in a in a cottage versus they want an umbrella exactly so it's a good litmus test to keep yourself honest that you want to flip all of the the pains it, you know if you have three pain bullets you'll have three dream bullets and they should be exact opposites and when you read them as the author of it it can feel a little bit childish or juvenile to be to, to do this literally and you can zhuzh it a little bit later you can rework the wording a little bit but as an exercise first draft I would flip them and the goal of the dream section is by the time they get to the end of it they're thinking yeah that all sounds great but how do I do it you want them to ask that but how because that is the question that creates an opening or a hook for the fix to hang on so mm -hmm. if, if they don't have a question then there's no there's just no spot for the fix to land the thing that you're trying to sell there's just no place for it to it just bounce off their head it just doesn't have a spot to live so you have to create that spot by presenting them with this puzzle it's like you want you're currently like this you'd rather be like that and the implication is that the the person who wrote the page has the solution to get at least contribute from getting from point a to point b and then their brain is a little bit more open to the idea of like, okay, how, how is this supposed to work? Like what? And, and then they can start reading about the fix in section three. This is your offer. I, I want to interrupt here for a second, but we can, we can defer this to later if, if, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. I always have trouble with the pain and the dream. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, especially for my mastermind where it's an existential problem. It's, you know, it's that they're not achieving all that they can. Mm -hmm. So it's not this daily pain. They're, they're making revenue. They're doing well by any definition, but they know they can do better. So mm -hmm. I just, it, and part of it is my personality naturally, is I want people to see the nirvana, the dream. Yep. So one of the things I've done many times is I've started with the dream and it doesn't work as easily for the reasons that you just said, right? You're not yeah. leading into that hook, but I'll throw that out there for anybody else who's had that same challenge. Yeah, there's, there is a, there are a million ways to do a page like this, and that way is a very common variation. So if, if you are more vitamins than aspirin, 
and you're you're selling the dream more than you're selling the fix, then I think the the way to do it is to sell the dream first section, just like you said, and then the sec se second section looks a lot like the challenges that they've encountered that have prevented them from getting where they know they want to go so far. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you want to be able to retire wealthy, you know, and you do some more dream in there. And then it's like, but life comes up and things happen and you haven't been able to sock away that cash. And, you know, you, uh, you don't want to live a life where you can't afford a latte and, and all of these challenges that have prevented them from reach, reaching the dream. That's a very common variation. So instead of pain dream, I would, I would call that one like dream obstacles, you know, section two would be like obstacles, the things that they've, or things that they've tried that have Challenges. failed. Challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So another thing to, to point out about either one of those, either one of those variations, the pain dream or, or uh, dream challenges or dream blockers is you really want to use language that you literally heard verbatim from ideal buyers. So, you know, we've talked about listening mm -hmm. tours in the past. It's easy to make this stuff up. But there's something magic that happens when you use the words they used. And yes, and it is just people would just email me and be like, you're you I was laughing as I read down this page. It was you. You had my ticket. Like, I get that one all the time. It's like, yeah. oh, you, <laughs> you, were, got my you were in my head. <laughs> yeah. Get out of my head. That's another one yeah. I got. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not I'm not in their head, but I was in someone someone who has a similar situation shared their language with me and it really seems to make a huge difference it feels somehow it feels more real it feels less generic it it pops off the page more it's more crispy sometimes i say mm -hmm. it just feels real um cool okay so now if you've got them if you've got them past the second section either format dream first or dream second they're going to be and they're still reading or they're still on the page, they're going to be wondering how. So they've, they've seen enough to know that, well, this is worth my time to read a little bit more. And that's where the fix comes in. So it's like, oh, are you cold and wet? Imagine being warm and dry. And then the fix could be something, could be a million things. It's like, what's the difference? It could be an umbrella, it could be a taxi, it could be a cozy hotel bar with a fireplace. It could be a lot of different things. Uh, and this will be true for you too. You know, if you, whatever you sell, there are alternatives and I wouldn't even say competitors yet. There are alternatives. They could, yeah. they could solve this problem probably in at least three ways, maybe a dozen ways, depending on how much they want to spend, how much time they want to invest, how, yeah, how important it is to them, how urgent that is, how much assistance they want. There's a lot of different things going on so that now they're like, okay, I would like that dream. I do have this pain and let me see if this fix maps into my reality in a way that I could perhaps take advantage of it. Of course, price is a big factor here too. Mm -hmm. So in the fix, this is this is where most people who are new to writing a sales page, this is where they start. And this ends up being the entire page is just the fix. It's like my road mapping service will do a grip up, you know, and they just mm -hmm. start off describing the fix, but they haven't made the space in the person's mind to care about it yet. They don't understand why it might matter to them. So in this section, you just paint a picture of what the engagement would be like. So uh, what would be an example? It's like, it's like, maybe this is for a, a vacation getaway. Maybe it's like Breeze Airlines has a $39 deal to, to the Bahamas. It's just like a million ways to can solve the cold and wet thing. So let's say mm -hmm. it's a trip to the Bahamas for under $200. Like what? Imagine, you know, you, you know, the, the fix is like breeze airlines. We've revolutionized the industry by having point to point air, you know, da, da. and then you can start talking about your product a little bit or your service a little bit and, uh, how it would work. Well, how does this work? You know, you don't have to, you don't have to stand in a, uh, it's not like a bus like Southwest, you know, we're, we're like, it would be like this. You open up the app, enter your information, pick a flight pick a return flight, run your credit card, automatically insured, done. You know, just give them a, a high level view of what it would be like. So for a consulting engagement or something like that, uh, let's say, let me pick something real so I'm not just riffing. But once you pick a productized service, I think, you know, we've got a lot yeah. of those, maybe like a strategy session right. or a series of strategy sessions for a particular outcome. Right. Yeah. My, I think my coaching page is a uh, private coaching page is a, 
um, it's it's pretty long. It's on the long side, but it does a it it follows the format. And in that section, there's sort of like the high level thing where it's you know uh, once you book your once you make payment, you can click here to to apply now. Then we'll do uh, a meet and greet on Zoom. And then assuming that we both think it's a good idea to move forward, you'll make payment and then you'll schedule a kickoff call using Calendly. You can pick it any time that's convenient. Once you pick that time, we'll have that kickoff call and then your four month clock will start. So you can book it now and, and not start for three months or whatever. And then every other week we'll have an accountability call. It usually lasts about an hour, hour and a half where we review your to do's from the previous call. We work through each one. We either mark it done in progress or uh, not done, not started. And we'll talk about why you're blocked uh, in between calls. You can message me 24 uh, seven unlimited in a private Slack room, yada, 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 yada. And so, and just describe the details. This is the thing that people usually want to talk about when they're writing a sales page. Right. Let me tell you all the features. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have on that particular page, I take it a level deeper and I, I say something like uh, the nitty gritty or the fine print. And I answer, you know, maybe six of the most common questions I have gotten from people. There's actually an FAQ section separately, but this is like, like the fine print, like, you know, you're allowed to record the phone calls if you like, it's fine with me. Um, you're not allowed to have partners or anybody else on the call. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. I can't remember all this stuff, but it's a little bit more detailed, but they're the very common questions that are features of the, uh, features of the offering. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So you, you don't need to describe every little thing, but you do want to describe the big picture so that they have a sense and the price will be in here too. A lot of people put it later. Yeah, it could later. be, it could be in the call to action, but I think these two sections are adjacent, so it's kind of neither here nor there. It's going to be probably at the end of the the fixed section and leading into the beginning of the, the call to action. So at any rate, the fix is usually the easiest part for everyone because they understand their own offering and they can describe it pretty easily. So that should probably don't need to talk about that too much more. Now, the, the fourth section, the first call to action, and this is the last section of the really important stuff, is... There, there is a button here that allows the reader to do the thing you want them to do. It's not learn more. It's, it is make a purchase, complete a questionnaire, apply now, book a call, schedule an appointment, um, add your name to the waiting list, enroll now. It, it is a, it is a command, right? It's like, this is, yep. uh, it's a verb, like do Start, this. Yeah, starts with a verb. Yeah. So great. This is what you want them to do. And for, for those that are not developers, this should be a big button. It <laughs> should be in major contrast to all of the copy and the colors around it. Your eyes should be drawn to this giant button. Yes, there should be no question in their mind of what you want them to do and how they do it. It's like, click here. Yes. Okay, so there's a couple of important things that I, I group into the CTA area. Um, another one, right after the button, in sort of fine print, like maybe it's smaller text, maybe it's italic, address what you think or know is the number one objection that the person is going to have from clicking on that button. So if it's like book an introductory call, the immediate objection is that it's going to be a hard sell. You're just going to like a attack them on the call and just pressure them into pulling out their checkbook. So just, just say like, this is not going to be a high pressure sales call. I just want to make sure that we're a good fit before money changes hands. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or for like an email, you see these all the time on email opt-ins, which is essentially a kind of sales page where it says, don't worry, I hate spam too. I'll never share your ad email address with anyone. And I'll only send you what I told you I'd send you and that kind of thing. Um, if it is a direct purchase, uh, or like, I think on my, on Ditcherville, the membership community, which is a subscription, it would say something, I think it says, uh, uh, don't worry, you can, uns you can cancel at any time and your credit card won't be charged again. So mm, it, it's yeah. just whatever they, whatever is the fear going through their mind as their mouse is hovering over that button, just put the thing that is the thing that is going to make, you know, reverse the objection that is going to make them delay and procrastinate and forget to come back and all of that. 
One more thing that I love adding when you can do it right after that, some kind of guarantees, whether it's um, satisfaction guarantee or money back guarantee or it depends on there's like we could do an entire phone call or an entire episode on types of guarantees, depending on what the oh. service is. Actually, we should. I'm making a note. We should. That's a good follow up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there's lots of different kinds of guarantees. You're not going to give a 100% money back guarantee on a 12 month project, but you can give a 100% money back guarantee on a $49 ebook or, you know, money back guarantee. But you can, like I said, you can give satisfaction guarantees or, or big smile guarantee, whatever, whatever the thing is that you are willing to commit to, to correct a situation where the client is not happy, then just say what you would do anyway, right? So like if you're new to guarantees, I would basically just advise you to put the thing there that you would do anyway if a bad situation happened. So like what could happen in a client engagement on this particular th th sales page that you're writing for this offer? What could happen where you'd be so mortified that you'd want to do something about it? And what would you do? I think anybody can answer that question. Anybody that's been in business for a while be like, oh man, that, that stunk. What could I do to make it stink less? Or what could I do to try and correct it? Or at least turn this potential one-star review into a five-star review, like this opportunity. How, what would I do to turn a one-star into a five-star review? And then write that right after the call to action and right after the fine print risk reversal, then have a, you know some kind of guarantee that is going to make them even more comfortable right by right where that button is. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think that's everything I put it, I, I consider in the, the first call to action section. So those four things, tr pain, dream, fix, call to action. If you stopped there, you'd be doing great. That's a great place to start. Most of my sales pages start off like that. And then, uh, and then I think about, it, I kind of percolate on these things, but, but that's the beginning. And then I would move on to, future sections, one of which is the second call to action, which you can literally copy paste from the first one. So that's almost like a gimme. Um, cool. At, I feel like I'm um, motor mouthing here. Like any questions or observations? Well, yeah. Well, I'm letting you because, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you, I mean, this is a, this is an interesting thing for people to look at and I kind of want to follow the flow of all of this and I, I think the key here is when you get to this point the first call to action is like if you do all of this for something that's brand new because we're going to talk about social proof in a second you if, if you've already got an audience you're hitting on their pain you've designed the kind of solution that your kind of people are looking for the solution matches the pain and the dream you're golden I mean, it's why it's why I think it's challenging when you do your, especially when you do your first um, sales page, whether it's a product or service or productized service, is you look at all these fabulous pages by the big names in the field, mm. and you're like, oh my god, they've got 47 smiling, happy faces <laughs> in here that are famous. Like I don't have that, or I my it's only a page. It's not you know 12 pages. Of copy, right. it's like it's one scroll or three scrolls instead of ten or fifteen scrolls. Like a a, rem, a Ramit Sethi uh, scroll is gonna, you know, your wrist is gonna get sore. So the, <laughs> right. I think the key here is to just really get comfortable with these first four pieces, and then everything else is gravy. Yeah, totally agree. It's so you get these right, and you're in good shape. Um, okay, so then moving on from there. The, the rest of the stuff, let me see, the rest of the stuff is nudging. It is helping them feel less risk in the transaction. Whatever the call to action is, it might not be a transaction. It might be an apply now or book a free 15 minute call. It, it's, but you're asking them to give you something, it, at least their email address, maybe their time. They're, you're asking them to expose themselves be, to be a little bit vulnerable. So the rest of the page is really about making them feel like it's a safe bet. Like you're not going to waste their time. You're not going to spam them. You're not going to waste their money. So this the right after the the call to act, the first call to action with that wonderful hundred percent money back guarantee that you're going to put in there <laughs> comes the social proof. So like the smiling faces of people who have just been transformed in the way that you promised above is that uh, that re will resonate with the ideal reader of the page. 
So we, you know, there's a, there's a companion page on my website called building the perfect testimonial that you can go through that will give you a framework, a literal step-by-step -step guide with two, I think two or three templates of how to reach back to your past clients and get testimonials, but th that are meaningful business oriented testimonials and not just like, she's great, you know? Yeah. So there's that, but what do you do if you don't have past clients or you don't have past clients for this particular product or offer because it's brand new? Some things you can do are in the social proof section, if you have a, I've, I don't love this, but you can do it. I think it's fair is to, if you have testimonials for, let's say a different package of this same expertise, you might be able to find testimonials that will fit here. So instead that are more about you and your ability to create transformations in your clients' lives and not about this particular packaging of it. So it's, it's, what's an example? So if I created a crash course in ditching hourly billing or a workshop in ditching hourly billing, or I'll just use podcast challenge as an example. So here, here I am a podcast challenge and like, like, then I would perhaps have testimonials about the podcast that I've created. Again, I don't love this. It's not mm -hmm. great, but you know, it's not if, ideal. It's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. If you've got a bunch of examples of people, it's like, oh my God, your podcast changed my life. It's the first thing I look for on Monday morning with my coffee. At least that, at least something to indicate that you, that other people believe that what you do is good. It's effective. And in theory, then you could teach it. Um, Obviously, it'd be better if you, once you run the course a few times or run the thing a few times, you get testimonials about this specific packaging of your expertise. That's better, but it's, it's, um, you usually don't have those at first. Um, although I do sometimes recommend, especially with productized services, that you get three beta testers, three beta clients or customers, run them through it pro bono in exchange for feedback on the marketing the sales page, the delivery, the pricing. And if you loved it, uh, maybe you could give me a testimonial. So you could launch after a beta with three clients, you could launch with three glowing testimonials on a uh, your first public version of the sales page. But a lot of times you don't have to do that. I mean, if you're starting from scratch, you might need to, but if you've been delivering a service for a while and you're productizing aspects of it, um, you probably don't need to go through that exercise of doing three freebies. But right. I, I think the other the other thing, though, is that I just want to caution. Um, sometimes people get really lazy with their website. You're not a developer. You have to hire somebody to come in and change it. So you might be you might go ahead and do something like Jonathan suggested on the, the podcast style testimonial. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to leave that up forever. That's got to be something that you're looking at as a placeholder until you get actual testimonials from the thing that you're selling on this page. hundred percent. Yes. It's a, it's a placeholder. That's a great way to put it. Um, other things you can put in here depend on the social proof section. Number five is, or, or th depending on the service could be things like client logos, um, case studies, uh, trusted by, or as seen in Forbes, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. So you, any third, so social proof, it's, it's really a third party validation. So like, uh, you know, spoke at these big conferences. So it's like, you basically say, notice we haven't talked about you. There's no part of this page yet that talks about you yet. It doesn't, it hasn't come right. up yet. The fix doesn't talk about you. The fix talks about the, the product or the service. It's not. So we're getting to the point where in the page now we're halfway we're to the middle of the page we're halfway down and all of a sudden it's like Jonathan transformed my business by teaching me one thing about proposals or, or something like that or mm -hmm. it's it's uh, back when I was doing sort of big ticket consulting it was the logo ribbon it was just a wall of logos you know staples whatever HP time yeah. magazine stuff like that so it's like geez this person somebody else trusted this person and they're at least happy enough with the outcome that they're not suing them to take the logo off their website. <laughs> so it's social proof means third party validation. It, I suppose it could be if this was a page for a book, it could be your reviews from Amazon. It could, you know, like 45,000 five star reviews. You know, it's it's other yeah. people saying this person is good at what they're doing. Or your blurbs, you know, if it's a book. Yep. 
yeah, that's another great example. Um, cool. Okay, so this is this particular area does evolve quite a bit at the beginning, as Rochelle pointed out. It it can as you start making sales, this part you could keep coming back and making better and better and better over time for sure. And and do not be shy about this. I mean, I think there's a lot of times, especially first timers with a sales page, are kind of reluctant to beef this up. It feels like like bragging and your mom told you you shouldn't brag. Um, this is a great opportunity to do that because you're not bragging. Other people are singing your praises. So don't be shy about including yeah. this. Right. Yeah, great. Okay, so that moves us to section six where you'd start overcoming objections. I, I usually do this as a series of FAQs, which almost always start with you guessing at what people might ask. Uh, it can also be from from people who have reviewed the page for you who ask questions about it. You're like, oh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, as you get more eyeballs on the page, you're you're organically going to get questions about it. So over time, this is another one of those mm -hmm. spots where it, it tends to evolve over time. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, sometimes someone will ask a question. You're like, duh, I should have put that in the fix. Like, that's huge. Like, I really yeah. that should have been up in section what three. And so you might do that. But. Um, a lot of times when, when I have someone work, you know, putting what I think is too much, like the fix section is getting out of balance with the pain and the dream. It's just getting like way too big. I'll take some of the stuff that's a little bit, it feels a little bit more fringe and recommend that they put it in the FAQs. You know, what if I've already taken five mm -hmm. courses like this and, and I dropped the ball every time? Or what if now's not a great time? Or what happens after I pay? Or, you know, all, all of these, there's some common ones that you can start with, um, and yeah, over time, this will, this will grow naturally. You know, they, they should literally be questions that are frequently asked, not stuff you just made up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a difference between having it in someone else's voice versus yours mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's better in theirs. Yeah. And here's another point. Uh, I think this is, I was going to talk about this later, but now it's just as good. Um, people scan before they decide they're going to read every word. They're not going to start at the top and read every word to the bottom or even halfway or even a, they just scan around. They're going to, they're going to get the gist to be like, Oh, this page might be worth something. And they're going to probably scroll looking for stuff that grabs their eye. And I, I want to talk about this at the end with regard to headlines for each section. But in this case, mm -hmm. it's perfectly fine to repeat yourself in the FAQs. So even though it's in the fix, you might want to say in the FAQs, you know, some eye catching question, what happens after I pay? Like you probably described that up in the fix section or in the call to action section, but it's okay to repeat it because people aren't going to read every word. And the longer the page gets, the fewer the words are probably going to read. So they're, or at least well, percentage wise. Plus I think, I think when I read a sales page as, you know, an interested potential buyer, I tend to go to the FAQ thing because there, it's like, there's a lot of stuff there. I, I do exactly what you describe where I'll scroll through it. And then I want to see if it's not FAQ, it'll be something similar. I want to kind of see like, what's the nitty gritty here. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think repeating helps. Even if somebody reads it all, they're still not going to remember that you said it, you know, three, three uh, scrolls above. <laughs> right. Yeah. So some classic ones in here would be, well, I listed a few. Another one is, uh, is there a money back guarantee? Um, yeah, there's a bunch. I mean, you can go to, go to any mm -hmm. sales page on my site and you can get inspiration for it. I, I try, I actually try to follow this format on every page because I know people are going to, you know. <laughs> try and use the it's, it's like to give people something to copy um okay so so yeah it's usually it's usually in the form of an faq but if you have other ways that make sense to overcome objections then this is a this is the place to do it uh okay. all right moving on from there section seven this is where you get to talk about yourself so in sec section seven is uniqueness and here you want to highlight the things that make you more attractive to your ideal clients or buyers than your competitors. So you can talk about your mission in life, your background. You can have a picture of your dog. This is the about <laughs> page of the sales page. So like the stuff you'd put on your about page on your website, this is where you're allowed to talk about yourself, what makes you unique, different, uniquely suited to help uh, solve this pain, deliver this mm -hmm. dream. And, you know, it's... I, uh, in mine, I generally have a picture of me and it says like, you know, hi, uh, this is Jonathan or the headline will be something like who wrote this page anyway, or something like that. 
and give them a sense that there's a person here behind the 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 page like is who is the human being behind this and uh, that's not going to not everybody not every sales page needs to have a face of the brand behind it but i think for people listening to this show it's probably going to be the normal case is that you the person buying this service is probably a service and the person buying it is going to want to know who they're going to be working with so um this is the spot where you can start kind of you know the about you the resume piece i've been doing this for 20 years i've helped 2000 people just like you get these outcomes and that kind of stuff well, I, I want to reinforce this idea of, of a photo of you because a lot of listeners, even if you have a solo business, you may have a company name that isn't yours that you use yeah. everywhere. And people don't buy companies, they buy people. So especially on, on the sales pages, let them see you. It can just be a headshot. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but let them see you in mm -hmm. relation to, to these promises. A lot of people also put like an image of their signature in this area that, that I, really appeals to me. It's stupid, but it really appeals to me when I see it. I've never done it, but um, but it just the the really personal piece. You could even have maybe a little video there. I've never done that, but it, it, it's the piece where you want to be at. It's the most human place on the page, I guess, mm -hmm. about you, yeah. not about your buyer. Uh, so, which I guess I'll just reiterate, this whole page should be about the buyer. Everything is about the buyer. Even the part that's about your fix, it's about the buyer. This is why this will work for you. Even about the thing that's about you is still seen through the lens of the buyer, right? You're still writing that to to grab their their attention. Well, attention maybe, but comfort, to increase their comfort, comfort. Mm -hmm. that you are the solution, the right yeah. solution for them. Safe choice, all things considered. Mm -hmm. So cool. And that brings us, we're in the home stretch now. Section eight is mm -hmm. <laughs> second call to action. Generally, I just copy paste the first call to action into this section. Sometimes you might want to do, because we're getting to the end of the page, sometimes in the, the sort of right under the button in that little fine print, in, you know, where before I would say, don't worry, it's not going to be a high pressure sales call, or don't worry, I hate spam too. Um, you might alter that in the second call to action and include something instead like not ready to book a call or not ready to sign up for my list. Click here to browse the archive or click here to join my mailing list, like a secondary fallback call to action. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, other than that, or maybe something in the footer like, you know, join my subscribe to my email list. You don't want any other calls to action on this page. You want big button you want every button that's on the page. You can you can put more than two, but you want the the buttons to have the same label, the same color, and you know, yes. super clear what's going to happen if you click on that button. So usually, I just copy paste them, and they're exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. You you want that continuity so that they again, it's 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 very subtle, but mm -hmm. it's reinforcing the trust that this is the same offer, it's the same button, it's the same person, it's the same price. Yeah. I, when I, when I imagine, when I see pages where there's like a million links everywhere, I just have this almost cartoon version of my mind of like someone sitting at a computer with like question marks f flying around their head. <laughs> like you don't want any question marks. You want zero question marks. Like what happens when I click on this? Or like, is this button, this, this button is a different label. Instead of apply now, it says uh, submit or subscribe. Or it's like, wait, wait, what is this? Um, on that, while we're talking about it, it's not specific to this section, but while we're talking about it, on a sales page, you want the person on this page to do exactly one thing, and that thing is click on your call to action. Do not link out to 10 blog posts. Do not link out to YouTube, oh, your YouTube channel. Yeah. Do not, ideally, do not have navigation. They got to the page you want them at. There is one thing you want them to do. If you have not yet mm -hmm. built up the trust, then they're going to bounce and and if you've got links to other stuff, you're, you're just giving them an opportunity to, you know, resist. Just be like, uh, procrastinate. Just, uh, I'll just, I'll browse the blog for a while. You're not giving them a clear path. Like, and most of us, if we're not 100% engaged and you see a little headline that looks like it might be interesting, like, like when I read the New York Times in the app and there's like four other articles like this and I look at the headline and go, ooh. So I don't finish the article I'm reading. I go click on the next one. 
Yeah. Right. And then I wind up not finishing that one either, which says more about me than the New York Times. But um, <laughs> that's that's what you want to do. This is you want to design the path that your people that you want your people to follow. Mm-hmm. What do you want them to do? And in this case, it's the sales page. You want them to pull the trigger. So yeah. don't give them any other place to go. Yep. And there's another there's another interesting point to bring up here, I think, which is that if they got to this page and they don't trust you enough to make this purchase yet, it's too you're not gonna you're not gonna change that in this visit. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's no reason to build up to if they got to this page, they either have enough trust or they don't. And giving them an easy out is not not going to help you know because people will say well oh well maybe they're maybe they're not ready to buy and, but if they read a few of my blog posts then they will then it's not going to happen no. not this time no not this time they're going to see you in social media again and they'll be like oh or they're going to see something on the mailing list and be like i really should sign up for that podcasting course because the trust is built up over time and then when they get to the page the trust is either enough or it's not enough uh, the other thing is the other thing that is going to create trust in the moment is the the well the pieces of the page that are about them so basically everything so that the if you nail the pain and you nail the the dream and you nail the fix and they've never heard of you before and the price is right they'll still buy but don't link out to your blog and for crying out loud don't link to your social media or your YouTube channel or any of that that's where they came from you don't want to yes. send them back well, and the other thing that happens, especially if somebody's relatively new on your list or they, you know, they just found you, is maybe they go through this and they look at it and they go, "Boy, that's pretty interesting." But I'm not sure yet. Maybe it's the price, maybe it's you, maybe it's the fix, you know, I'm just not sure. But I I'm interested in this. And so so you, you know, they don't buy this time and then you sell it again. Mm-hmm. And the second time, you know, they're on your list, they get the link and they go, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm ready this time or maybe not. Maybe they're still, but you're building trust with this sales page because probably the second time you do it, you have um, maybe you, the, your language is tighter. You have more focused FAQs. Um, the person's situation has changed a little bit. And then what's interesting, and Jonathan, I, I'm sure this has happened to you as well, is that people will start to email you and say, you know, I really want to do your you know, XYZ program, and I'm not sure if I'm ready yet. And they'll ask you a question, yeah. and then they're ready, right? right? Or they'll say, I really want to do it, but I don't meet the criteria yet. But my mm-hmm. goal is to meet that because I really want to do this. Yes, that does so happen. The sales page hits people in ways that you don't expect. So even when you don't make a sale, you are working on a future sale. Yep. Yeah, you're living rent free in their head, especially if the price is on the page where they're they'll yeah. like people will just consider stuff for years and it's like, "Oh, you know, I mm-hmm. saw you on Christo's thing in 2019 and and I've been thinking about it ever since and, you know, I see the price keeps going up every year, so, I, you know, I'm ready." That's a classic this one. This is the year. Yeah, this is the year. <laughs> um, a classic one is especially for workshops is like cuz they cuz they only launch once or twice a year, so people really feel high urgency, which is going to be the next section mm-hmm. we talk about. But yeah. They'll be like, ah, oh, I really want to sign up for this. I really, be- I've been thinking about it, but I'm going on vacation that week and I don't want to split my attention or whatever. That's a really common one. And mm-hmm. whatever, you know, can, it's like, well, you can buy it now and go through the videos on your own after or you get back or whatever, or you can just join the next time. And they're like, when's the next one going to run? So people think about this stuff for a long time. Yeah. Um, and anyway, your, so, your people, yeah, your people, the people that you've hit with the, the pain, the dream, the fix. Yeah. The right people. Yeah. 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 These, and generally speaking, these are not impulse purchases. So, you know, this, this format that might be interesting to note, this format is, I mean, you could use it for any price point, really. Uh, mm-hmm. it might be overkill for a $9 purchase. It's probably, you, you could still use it. Uh, but I, geez, I even use this format for free stuff, like like signing up for an email course or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, you do, uh, you do. We do have one final section, section nine, and that is urgency. So you want to give them some kind of to present them with some kind of stakes. So if they do nothing, because every, everybody wants to do nothing, it's like like conservation of energy is an evolutionary imperative. It's like be lazy because if you burn up all your energy, you're gonna die. 
So, <laughs> you know, it's a natural state of affairs. So you really, if you believe that you are, your this particular offer will help someone, then I think it's perfectly reasonable to at least hold up a mirror and say, you know, are you going to think about this for another year? Are you going to spend another year moving one inch in every direction? Or do you want to actually do something mm -hmm. about it? So you see, I the urgency stuff is another spot that can get super spammy. The pain section can get super spammy. Urgency can get super spammy. I urge people to only use true statements and not like those, I, those evergreen shot clock timers drive me crazy. Like where it's like, oh, offer running out in four hours or on Amazon, only one left in stock. Yeah, right. Well, the thing that drives me crazy in our space is the ones where they say, okay, you know, it's, it's, we're going to close the doors at midnight on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, I get an email that says, well, <sighs> we decided we're going to extend this offer. And I'm like, I just don't believe you. Right. I mean, that, that makes me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know what happened. You know they didn't get yeah, as didn't many people out. as they right. thought they would. Yeah. So we're like, all right, we're going to go back to whoever clicked on this thing and we're right. going to give them another offer. Yeah. I, so I, I've felt that impulse, but long game, you know, it's like people on people stay yeah. on my list for years and if they would remember, you know, if I, if I ran deals on a regular schedule, they would remember. It's like, oh, I'm going to wait till Black Friday. That's why I don't do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so some common ones, it, again true please keep them true i only take on one new client per month that's totally reasonable um something like only one spot left when that's true it's true so for private coaching that was a pretty common situation where someone would finish and then i have one spot and that would, that would be true um you see the limited supply the amazon thing I, I don't know how this would work in a service space unless it was it'd probably more like i've only got so much capacity to deliver at a high high uh and, level of and service then you'd say it differently than limited supply like you'd say i only take on one new client per month or however you exactly. define your availability yeah right um some things I, if you're selling product or cohort based workshops i do give people early bird discounts for uh, kind of raising their hand in advance uh, sometimes i do it sometimes i'll say like the first 10 people will get special pricing or first 10 people will get this bonus thing. Um, I don't usually do that. I would do it, but I'm kind of lazy and it takes a lot of work. So I tend not to do that because then you have to keep track of it and I don't want to like, like accidentally not do it. Um, or, or the common one, and this is real, like registration closes at midnight on date that every single mm -hmm. one of my workshops has that. Cause like the train leaves the station on Monday at nine. So, you know, I let yeah. people, I let people register up until the end of the first lesson so if I do like a five day challenge that starts Monday, uh, runs through Friday, I leave registration open until midnight on the Monday, mostly for time zone reasons, because I get tons of people from New Zealand and all over the place. And it, I just end up getting all these emails like, oh, I missed the deadline. Like, could you, is it too late? And well, it's that day difference with Australia and New Zealand it gets yeah. tricky. Yeah, it gets weird. So, um, so yeah, so sale ends on date and, and that brings us to the end. Uh, the sales page 101 tour de force <laughs> well i want to hit on something that you sort of tossed off but I, mm -hmm. I i think it's worth talking about just a little bit more and that is you said your offer will help someone mm -hmm. and i think that's the mindset that's really important to have with this is that you're doing this to help somebody to get a specific result and so it's okay to sell it is better than okay it is you are if you don't sell you're denying people the opportunity to be better than they were before they experience this thing so just you know this is not the time for false modesty this is the time to you know you're focusing on your client your potential buyer but it's really about the impact that your offer will make and if you don't let them know about it, they're not going to be helped. And they're not going to know about it, right? And and, and yeah. this is not an email you send to someone. Someone is on your page reading it, which means that they're interested. So if they get past the top, they are interested. Um, all right. So let, let's just do the last. Let's wrap up on this one final thing, which you will see in uh, in the examples that we haven't talked about yet. So if you go and click on any of the links in the show notes, you'll see that once once you've got these sections done, or at least the first four, 
and you're feeling pretty confident. You've showed it to a few people and you're like, all right, say it back to me. What is this thing? And they're describing it appropriately. You're like, okay, the, the message is getting across. I do a kind of summary at the top above the fold in the hero section, whatever you want to call it. That's like the name of the thing, a two line description, a one sentence, maybe two, maybe 12 word description of what it is and then the benefits and a call to action right there at the top. So if someone is coming to the page ready to buy, they already know, they've heard of it before, or they are, that someone told them about it or shared a link immediately in the first five seconds, they know what it is and how to buy mm -hmm. it. So for example, on uh, what's a good one. So like for my workshop, email 365, it's like, boom, email 365 five-day bold print a five-day interactive online workshop for busy professionals who want to build their authority fast and then three points build your authority grow your audience differentiate yourself and then when the next lesson starts and call to action and then right after that i put a testimonial so like there's this unit at the top that summarizes the entire page it leads with three benefits and it's a, a clear articulation of what the thing is so and i pull it up to the top so as soon as you land on the page, you know who it's for, you know whether or not you're one of those people. Um, I, I often do this on pages at the very top. If I don't do that, the thing that I'll put at the top instead, because most of these workshops I sell to my mailing list and, and they're primed. If I have something like brand new, I start off with a heck yeah headline, which mm -hmm. yeah, I think we've mentioned before, but I yeah. want I want the person to know immediately when they land on the page, that this is for them. They are in a place that is built specifically for them and it will probably not be a waste of their time to at least scan the headlines, the rest of the headlines, scan down the page and see what the deal is. So it'll be something like, it, it'll be, usually it's the top pain. So are you sick of being cold and wet and shivering all night? And it's just like, yeah, yeah, I am. And then that just, and then it would immediately go from that heck yeah headline into sound familiar and then you'd list out some pains and then dream then fix. So, so the, if you go to one of my pages, especially the workshop pages, you're going to see this unit at the top. It's kind of like section zero. That's a summary of the entire thing boiled down into a small enough amount of text to fit on one screen. Uh, but if you, if it, it, it's a little hard, like it takes some, it's hard. So if you don't do that, then what I would do for the headline of the page is to take the top pane from your pane section and make that the headline. Are you sick of, are you frustrated by you know, does it drive you crazy that juniors are, you're losing deals to junior developers or whatever. Uh, and that's, that's, and that would be the hook that would get them to read, start reading. Mm -hmm. Hook, hook, hook. <laughs> yeah. And here's another, here's another closing comment. As you look at other sales pages or as you browse around the internet, or as you find yourself presented with offers, notice how you react to them. So I think you'll notice, especially if you're on like an Instagram, really anywhere that has paid ads, you're going to notice a lot of these things, especially heck yeah headlines and naming the pain. It's everywhere. Like you'll start seeing it everywhere. If you listen to the radio, almost every single ad starts with a heck yeah question. Have you been injured in an accident? <laughs> right? All the time. The best billboard, best billboard I ever saw, it just said hungry and then McDonald's logo next exit. <laughs> they're not trying to convince you to be hungry they just say are you hungry they didn't say are you hungry it's just hungry question mark mm -hmm. greatest greatest yeah uh, yeah and that's the other thing is that you know we talked about how some of these really successful page uh, sales pages are just so long when you're writing your first one short isn't bad if every word matters and there's no fluff and I say fluff, you still have to work on the emotion because I think that's important. But it's amazing what you can do, that you can do as much with a few words as you can with many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully this, this has been kind of a marathon. Hopefully people find it useful. Uh, as always, you know how to get in touch with us. If you have follow-up questions or ideas for a follow-up episode, that would be fabulous. Uh, but we should probably wrap it up for this week. I think we should. Oh, I said should. <laughs> I think we must. <laughs> cool. All right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time for the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye-bye.